Yes, I'm, I'm here. Hi, Eric. Hi, everyone. Uh, my apologies. It's, it's one of those nightmare scenarios where, uh, you know, you're struggling to get the technology going, but it doesn't work. So my apologies for being a few minutes late here. And thank you, Eric, for your introduction. Uh, as, uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, you know, my name is Herman Gomez, and uh, I work here at the Work Learning Headquarters as the TESOL Education and Training Center's director, uh, which uh, basically implies that I work with a, a lot of uh, different training centers and, and teacher education programs uh, around the, the world, uh, managing them from our headquarters here in Washington, D.C. So it's really great to see everyone here today. Um, I'm going to ask for a big favor if you're able to turn on turn on your camera so I can see you. That would be great. If you prefer to remain, uh, you know, without the cam with the camera off, it's okay. But it, it would be great if I could actually see your uh, your very bright and smiling faces this morning, right? And uh, and um, and also the the second thing that I will ask you is um, that during the presentation. Uh, I will uh, ask some questions and, um, you know, 1 of the big advantages here is that the fact that we are gathering a group of people. Who are so uh, ex well experienced and so talented in, in the field of education and STEM. And so there might be things that I'm sharing today that are not new to you, but what I'm looking for basically is for you to also share your experience. Because that's going to enrich uh, the experience of everyone in the group you bring in. Uh, tons and tons of, uh, of knowledge and, and, and expertise in this field and in education. And it would be really great to, 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 to be able for you to share as well. And so I will ask questions. Please feel free to answer. Uh, I, I'm not constrained to time when it comes to getting answers from you. Uh, what I do want to look for is for an open conversation and more of a dialogue that can go on uh, among us today. Okay. Um, so. That's great. So let me just see if I can share this. It's been a crazy morning already. So hopefully my my sharing won't uh, be a problem here. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. All right. Can um. All right. I'm gonna ask my go-to person here, Haley. Uh, can you, is that uh? Can we see that. Uh, yes, we can see your screen. Okay, awesome. All right. We can so, also see uh, your notes, just FYI. Oh, so how do I do this? Oh, okay. Hold on. Share to a second screen, Herman. I was having the same uh, <laughs> issue yesterday. Okay, hold on. One second. You know what I'm going to do? Hold on. If you have a, a second screen, you're just okay. pressing on slideshow and then. Uh, How's that? Is that good? All right. Sure. Awesome. Okay. Uh, all righty. So, uh, so why don't we get started then? So, uh, <clears throat> part of the agenda for today is I, I want to uh, provide a brief introduction to world learning, and I know that um, you know this is something that all that all of you may be well familiar with our organization, but I especially want to uh, share a brief introduction because uh, we we do have a lot of work with partners around the world and. A lot of what I'm going to share today has been part of our experience in, in working with partners around the world. And, and also the fact that we will discuss uh, the importance of core values when it comes to partner. Um, I will also uh, you know, work with you and ask some questions about your current partnerships. Uh, and your participation is actually appreciated in for this part of the, uh, of the, of the session. Um, then we will go into some basic premises about partnership, or at least this particular presentation, which I would feel are sort of key to keep in mind as we go through different uh, uh, aspects that we're going to discuss this morning. And then we will discuss some types of partnerships and finally aspects to consider when it comes to uh, partnering with other organizations. And again, um, a lot of this is just um, it, it has come to us through experience that we've that we've, uh, you know, we've had implementing different programs with partners around the world, but also uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from you as well in terms of your own experience. Okay, so just to get started, uh, word learning at a glance. We are uh, we as an organization were founded in 1932. Uh, we are a nonprofit or an international nonprofit organization. 
uh, with her headquarters in Washington, D.C., and uh, the School for International Training in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, we actually do a lot of work in core areas of education. We uh, work with over, over 627 institutional partners across the world, um, 92 programs in education. We also work, we have worked and we are currently working with a total of over uh, uh, participants from over 150 countries. Um, and we have a network of teacher, a teacher network that is a global teacher network uh, with about 7,800 uh, participants as well and 90,000 alumni from our programs globally. Um, the core areas that we work in are people to people exchanges. So you might have heard perhaps of uh, the IVLP program. Um, that is something that we're learning manages for the Department of State. Uh, we also do a lot of work with global education and STEM innovation. Um, one prime example is uh, different uh, STEM uh, centers that we have uh, in STEM projects that we have around the world. We are currently in the process of opening up a, a STEM center in Saudi Arabia, which will serve uh, as an after school, as an extracurricular um, STEM program for uh, for kids, middle age, uh, sorry, middle middle school, not middle age, middle school and uh, in high school uh, age students. Uh, of course, middle age, you know, quite quite welcome, and that's why I would be there too. So, um, uh, so that's part of the process that we're going through. Um, we also have uh, we work on institutional strengthening as well, working with universities uh, around the world, um, supporting their strengthening through. Teacher education through faculty capacity, capacity development uh, through system strengthening as well. Uh, we also do a lot of work in youth and work in workforce entrepreneurship, such as uh, a lot of the projects that we have going on in Algeria, working with uh, with youth there. Uh, we also have um, areas of uh, projects in civic engagement, uh, which um, we also have. Uh, are currently developing and implementing in Mongolia and Myanmar. Um, and finally, we have the TESOL, which is, you know, one of the uh, core areas of world learning is the TESOL and Eng English teacher training, which uh, offers uh, training programs to language, English language educators, uh, also at a global uh, scale, uh, working through certificate programs, funded projects, and um, and also, uh, as of uh, as of recently, working more with um, direct uh, work with students in the learning of English language, as, uh, of English as a foreign language. So that's a little bit of a glance. Uh, uh, we're learning at a glance. Uh, in terms of our core values, we're learning core values uh, guide all of our actions and are central to our identity, and they unite us to inform our internal and external relationships, and they drive the decision making and reflect how we do our work to fulfill our mission. And it, these values include the role of the community, there's intercultural understanding, social inclusion and justice, and of course, sustainability. This, these are core values that we have as an organization, which do play a key role in partnership, because as you will see later, uh, you know, this is one of the aspects that we suggest in considering when, when partnering up. Um, I will stop there and uh, see if you have any questions so far. Um, there may be just a way to go about it because I can't see everyone. Um, um, maybe if you can just go ahead and Haley, are they unable just to unmute themselves or or, or participants? Uh, do they need to request? Everyone, everyone can mute themselves and unmute themselves. Okay. Um, All right. So feel free to ask any questions. Um, if not, we can move on. Um, all right, so, uh, so I wanted to ask, I wanted to start with a, with a question uh, and what types of partnerships does your organization have already? Meaning private sector partners, local government agencies, foreign government agencies, local or international NGOs or individuals and families. So what are some types of partnerships that your organizations already have? I'm curious to hear if your voice is here. Maybe if you can say your, you know, if you want to participate, please uh, say your name where you are uh, based at the moment and, and share a little bit. 
And please, one at a time. Uh, So at the Binational Center in Guatemala, we have partnerships with um, local universities. Uh, we have some partnerships with the um, local municipalities. So there are programs like English language uh, programs that run with them. Uh, we have had a partnerships with local schools, like high schools and middle schools, and um, obviously we have a partnership with world learning and um, yeah. where we've been able to develop different uh, products and and programs um, so i think that those are some of the the central uh, pro, uh, partnerships that we've been able to develop and obviously with our community of of students and and uh, parents uh, everyone who's part of that community thanks marbella thanks for sharing and i'm i'm also seeing here that uh, adeline has uh, mentions that um, you've got a lot of partnerships with the U.S. Embassy and various projects, right? And also uh, local bilateral center and network uh, partnerships. Uh, Adeline, would you mind sharing what kind of local bilateral uh, partnerships do you have? Or just to give us an example of what they might be? Um, so we're working on a project right now that's funded by the U.S. Embassy. Um, and that's led by um, the Centro Ecuatoriano Norteamericano, which is the bilateral center with Ecuador and, and the U.S. Um, and that project involves uh, a network, uh, a research network uh, related to English language teaching. Um, so the binational center has agreements with uh, a group of eight different public and private universities around the country, and we're providing training programs for that project for people from those universities mm. through the bilateral center and funded by the embassy. Okay, thanks, Adeline. Thanks for sharing. Uh, sounds like a lot of exciting uh, different networks going on there, right? Okay. All right. Um, anyone else? Okay, uh, uh, let me share in a brief. So uh, I'm Binod from okay. Nepal, uh, and then we have uh, I, I'm from Kathmandu University uh, School of Education, and then uh, so being a teacher educators, we have partnership with different schools across the mm -hmm. country, and then we also have recently uh, uh, extended our partnership with different local government bodies, and then we do have partnership with few NGOs and INGOs. And then uh, in one project funded by uh, Norwegian government, we have partnership with three different universities, one university of our own country and one university from Norway. So in mm. this way, uh, we have been conducting partnership and then uh, we have been part of this world education. Perhaps we'll go for, for long, for years, hope so. Okay. It's really great to meet you. you. I've heard a lot about you and your organization and it's finally great to, to see a face to to the to the name that I've heard. So, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you for thank sharing. You. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, all right. So, why don't we move on then? Uh, so, thinking in terms of like the the types of partnerships that you already have, um, and again, you know, this is nothing that may be new to your organization, no matter what the scale is at the moment that you are managing in terms of projects. Um, we do want to take into account. Uh, some uh, some basic premises when it comes to this particular presentation and something that I want to establish for this presentation is the fact that, you know, one of those premises is that all efforts in partnership are to be focused on the benefit of the learner and learning outcomes. All right, quite often organizations may have a focus of establishing partners uh, partnerships so that the organization can grow. So that their portfolio of programs may be amplified, so that uh, there is a, a you know stronger foot presence on the ground or footprint on the ground, um, you know, for the organization. But ultimately, the goal of partnerships in an education progr program, as a best practice, should be that these ought to be focused on the on the beneficiaries, on their learners and learning outcomes. In partnerships that may enhance their exposure to different um, types of learning, uh, partnerships that may give participants options for uh, greater outcomes and learning from 
different perspectives. These are ultimately the, when we think about the, what's really important, what's the core, it's, it's all about the learners, right? It, it, and it should be all about the learners. Of course, the organization grows in the process, but that's just a byproduct. That's a secondary uh, result of the actual core uh, activity, which is supporting students to learn. And that's what we, you know, a, a premise that I wanted to have for this. Uh, the, the other thing is that uh, the best partnerships are those in which participating organizations grow from the experience. And um, quite often in, in partnerships, um, you know, if we work with, uh, in, you know, if we work with other, with other organizations, we want to ask ourselves, how are we also going to grow from this experience? What can we give to the other organization for them to also learn from us? And quite often when working with uh, different organizations, and this has been my experience working in different organizations in my uh, professional life, um, is that there are times at which we may say, we're getting a lot from this organization. We're benefiting from this really great organization. But we can also stop to think about, we're also putting in a lot into this partnership and we're also contributing to this partnership. So in that sense, we need to reassess the way, perhaps we need to reassess the way in which we see partnerships where it's, it's not a necessarily a big organization or, or a big established or well-known organization contributing to a smaller organization, rather it's two very important organizations building up each other for better programming in the future. That's something that, you know, I wanted to also bring up. Uh, the next point is that partnerships are at their best when they ensure long-term sustainability. And one thing that we always, and I've, I've, I've talked to some colleagues here at World Learning is that we're very happy to implement programs around the world, but we're also at times, you know, when we have to close programs, uh, sad that we have to do it. And we recently had to close out a, 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 an important program for us in Myanmar, given the current situation. But um, our local, our, our partner actually seems that they will be able to run with the ball. <laughs> and so that's ultimately the, ultimately the goal. When we partner and we are able to, through this partnership, develop and ensure long-term sustainability, that is a success. You know, it's not about the fact that we can be involved in the project for 5, 10, or 20, or 50 years. Rather, we know that after a period of time, we're able to step out of that project and know that the beneficiaries or students will continue to learn because capacity has been built in either locally, regionally, or within the, the, a country specific. Okay, so partnerships are not forever. They are, they should aim at allowing partners to run with the ball eventually uh, on their own. Um, the other uh, point is that all stakeholders involved are going through the human experience. And uh, I do think that the best example right now is this really uh, unfortunate situation, this, this um, health, the global health crisis that we've all experienced. And I, 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 I could honestly say that, uh, you know, I, I would expect everyone here in this virtual room to say, yes, this has affected me personally, right? And it's the first time that we can say there's a common thread among us um, beyond the fact that we are all uh, part of this human experience. But, you know, we all go through the human experience and, and in partnering, sometimes things will happen. Implementation is very challenging. Implementation is messy at times. And, and so, this is something to keep in mind, especially when we think about, you know, like the perfect partner or, you know, a partner that may not be as perfect. There are factors that we need to take into account that need to consider the human experience. And finally, there's also um, the, the role of the, the aspect of considering partnerships beyond the traditional model. Okay. And so this is something that I want to discuss today. Uh, there are some like certain traditional models that we have in mind when it comes to partnership. Uh, I'd like to propose some ideas today that we can discuss and maybe uh, also um, if you have some ideas also to share, that would be really great. Okay. I will stop there and ask um, 
looking at these basic premises for the presentation, um, what are some things that come to mind? Meaning, are there, uh, are there some of these aspects something that you have thought about or are already, you know, since you're involved in different projects, um, something that is familiar to you and, 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 and that, you know, it really resonates for you? And feel free to share, please. So you can either share or or type in the chat. Hi, hello everybody. My name is Monica. Um, I'm in I'm in Guatemala with Marbella and Luis Morales. Um, I work at IGA, and uh, something that you just mentioned, Herman, um, mm -hmm. about how partnerships don't always have to be like just like okay, we're going to like work together for a certain period of time, but the idea should be that. Um, once the partnership finishes, um, like both parties can continue working individually and yeah. uh, something like that kind of happened uh, here with one of the sites um, uh, that like there was a lot of training for for teachers in that site and then they were able to like uh, take everything on their own and um, I remember that that was like one of the comments uh, during that time, right? That it um, that we were happy that the people from the site were able to to work on their own without, um, let's say, without so much of our, of our input. So, I, I thought about that when you mentioned that. Thanks so much, Monica, and thanks for sharing. Um, you know, like just hearing you, I always um, it's something came to mind, right? And I've always thought that as a development organization. If we can't walk away from a project after 5 years to and ensure that the life of the project will go on, maybe we have not done our job. Right? And, uh, and, and, um, you know, thanks for sharing that because it, 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 there's always that sort of trauma of walking away. Right? And especially if, um, you know, you're very, uh, you know, like engaged and involved in a specific project as an organization, there might be that sort of thought, like, why do we need to walk away? But, um. That is part of implementing and development. And thank you for sharing and, and your experience there. Okay. Uh, would anyone else like to share? All right. Okay. All right. I guess we can move on then. Um, so those are some of the basic premises for this particular presentation. Um, something else that I wanted to uh, to share uh, as well is there are uh, different partnership options and 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 one of them is um, you know something that I, I I wanted to to bring up you know like in in terms of different partnerships we want to get away from the traditional partnership which you know, it's usually you know um, the 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 first thing that comes to mind is a partnership that is based on funding for example. And that's a, you know, a traditional view of, of partnering, but there's also other models that um, I wanted to share that you might already be familiar with. And one of them is the partnership um, options or the partnership option, partnership option based on programming and resources. And, um, and, you know, there are organizations that uh, work along these lines where the partnership that they establish uh, has to do with uh, what we call a collegial collaboration, and that may that may include, for example, the uh, exchange of uh, technical experts, the exchange of teachers between two or among more uh, three or more organizations. Um, it might also be the an option where there is um, a sort of exchange in in resources that are in common and meaning two like minded like vision organizations getting together and thinking we've got this you know set of resources that we could share with you 
And that's a way to partner. It's, it, it's a way to add value to a partner organization. Um, we don't necessarily need to uh, think in terms of, you know, these are our resources only, but rather thinking in terms of providing resources for others. Um, I've, I think I've shared with some of you in the, this virtual room that one of the things that I love about living here uh, is the fact that I have a chance to do some volunteer work during the week. And my, uh, what I do uh, once a week is that I teach an English class to immigrants uh, from Central America at a local community center here in, um, it's, uh, in, in, in Arlington. And, um, and it's really, um, you know, it's been really fulfilling for me to, to be able to be there. And one thing that I love about the community center that I volunteer in is the fact that they have this, uh, the value of abundance. And by abundance means that we don't need to fight for resources. That there is uh, an abundant uh, pool of resources that are available for everyone. And so they actually partner up with other organizations that are similar minded. And who share ideas, who share best practices and even share programming at times. Um, and in the sense that, you know, there is abundance and there's room for everyone. And so that's one of the things that I wanted to mention as something that came to mind in thinking about a more collegiate collaboration. Uh, the second option is the community type of collaboration. And by this, we mean asking our, ourselves the question, how, how much does your organization involve your local community? Um, for example, if you're having a, if you have a, a, a STEM center and offer STEM programming, um, how often do you have access to, or how often are you able to bring in people from the community or volunteers who could serve as instructors or facilitators or mentors within your program? This is something that uh, we have experienced in our Algeria project and our Algeria office where we run uh, STEM centers. Um, these are basically, uh, you know, programs that are run by volunteers and they are usually undergraduate students who come in to work with um, middle school, middle school age students and who serve as mentors for these students and the model has worked really wonderfully. And so what are some ways in which you can also, or you are already engaging the local community? And that's also a way to establish partnerships with individuals, um, with, uh, with people who, are, who might have expertise in those fields also within your local community. And finally, the other type of uh, partnership in programming could be the, through digital collaboration. Um, and this could be through sharing of digital resources, but also thinking in terms of the current social media uh, networks that you have. And, and thinking in terms of being able to share some of the activities and events that other organizations uh, are carrying out within your social media networks. And for us, uh, a prime example of this um, has been uh, that in, um, as we get started in Saudi Arabia and start up our, our office there, we also need to establish our name. Right? And, uh, Early on, uh, earlier on in this project, we actually partnered with a with an organization that had uh, it has a, a well established presence in country, and they agreed to share a lot of our programming through their social media and their social media network, and that's that's a way that in which they came on board and partnered up with us, um, and that's a, another option for a partnership beyond the just traditional one. Especially in this day and age where, you know, social media is so important and plays such a big role in getting to uh, in, in promoting and in, in, in basically sharing about the activity that our, uh, uh, you know, our different projects uh, are conducting. And so those are 3 options for programming and I'd like to stop here. And I'd like to ask, what are some things or what are some ways in which you are already doing some of these or carrying out some of these partnerships in programming. 
Um, or what are some ways in which this could be done in your organization? So two things, either things that you are already doing or what are some ways in which they could be done? So again, feel free to place your uh, your uh, your ideas on the chat, or if you we, you know if you want to share here in the virtual room, you're also welcome to. I always love to hear your voices, so you're welcome to. Hey, uh, just to uh, begin the discussion. So. Uh... Here in Nepal, uh, just looking into these three different perspectives, I think in our universities, uh, we have gone more the community collaboration because mm -hmm. one of our uh, university's vision is to uh, to work with community people and then to bring visible transformations in the schools of community. Because in, in our case, uh, we need a lot of support in school education and then uh, for school teachers, and we working in the universities as teacher educators or researchers. And if we simply conduct research activities in university level, uh, being um, more armchair researchers, that does not make change in the community. So our university has much uh, given emphasis in the community collaborations, and then we have been doing in the same case. And the next one is very interesting idea is that it, this is digital collaboration. So one of the problems that we normally face uh, for our graduate and postgraduate students is the access of the resources. For example, uh, this is uh, research papers and then so because normally we didn't have uh, used fundings to buy this uh, big database, resource database. And then for, for that purpose, we, we always uh, request to uh, other universities uh, that we have access those those platforms. And then if we get those resources, for our university also that would be great and then recently uh, we, we received uh, some of the uh, helps from those other universities i think that is more aligned with the digital collaborations just about the sharing the resources so thank you so much on this much from my side uh thanks thanks Bernard, and thanks for sharing and i do think that that's really a key and a, a great example of how this digital collaboration can take place so that's a way I think uh, Michael, uh, Michael, yeah. you want to, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hello, Herman. Good morning, everyone. Hey. Uh, Hi, good, greetings from Cali, Colombia. I hope you're all doing well. Um, well, I just want to mention something, uh, you know, in, in the, I think over 15 years of, of designing and implementing uh, mostly cultural programs uh, at the financial center here in Cali, one thing that I've learned um, is that Partnerships evolve in time. If you're able to maintain a partnership for a long uh, period of time, for example, I, uh, we have a festival here, a music festival that has evolved throughout 15 years. And throughout those 15 years, we've been able to maintain some of those same partnerships from the very beginning, but the partnerships have evolved. If at the beginning they were more aimed toward financial collaboration, now they're more aimed toward programming and content collaboration. So partnerships do evolve along with the projects if you're able to sustain um, them in time. And, and currently, because of the pandemic, we've seen a lot more of that. There's a lot more partnerships that are aiming toward digital collaboration, content collaboration, which is something that's been very uh, positive for us in, in, the, in the pandemic. Just wanted to share that, um, Herman. Thanks so much, Michael. And um, it, it, you know, I, I do I do agree with you that this is a, a great example as well as how this collaboration can take place. And 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 also what you mentioned, also this uh, sort of um, evolving of the of partnerships throughout time. Right. And um, one thing that I that comes to mind is the fact that you know in implementing organizations will develop specialties, right, or areas of of specialty. And and so. Um, you know, by providing or uh, sort of contributing with resources, we can all benefit from getting resources from an organization that has, uh, you know, a higher sort of level of specialization or 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 focus on, on specific areas. And and that's really that's really great. Yeah, it's uh, it's part of the process as well. Okay. 
Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, Adeline. Um, I commented in the chat, but I also wanted to add, um, I'm thinking about how a lot of US embassy funded programs emphasize cascading. Um, I think is the term they use a lot where our participants uh, then go on to share what they learned in the course with other people, often with their colleagues in their schools. Um, and we've done a lot to try to support our participants in being leaders in their communities to share ideas from our courses. And I don't know if I would really see that as a, a partnership because in some ways it's still directly part of a program in which they're participants, but it, I think it sometimes grows into a partnership, especially the participants who take a more active or proactive role in doing the cascading and sometimes go beyond what is uh, sort of strictly part of the course. Um, and thanks for sharing Adeline. And there's also that what I think something that um, that you mentioned is the fact that some of the course participants actually take it on as their own initiative, I suppose, right? That to share. And, and so in that sense, not only uh, let's say is this part of the project, but it also it, it also models um, how you know this type of collaboration can take place um, at the individual level. You know, working with colleagues, for example. And so thanks, thanks for sharing that. Yes, certainly. Um, they we are all a community of stakeholders in many ways in, in that sense. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I think Marbella mentioned that uh, that you are. Um, uh, okay, so yes, this is what Adeline mentioned, right? Mentioning the the idea of collaborating with uh, with IGA, um, and I hope you don't mind if I if I mention a little bit about your project, uh, uh, Adeline's organization uh, in Ecuador and Marbella's organization in in, in Guatemala, actually have partnered to uh, carry out the, a project for, for with, under the umbrella of the Cisco Phase Two project, uh, which works with uh, 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 STEM educators in Ecuador and in 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 Guatemala as well, and uh, so, you know, um, could I, I would you mind if I put you on the spotlight, uh, either Marbella or Adeline, just to briefly share what you are doing in collaboration? Either one of the two is fine. <laughs> so, um, the partnership was. Initially, I think we started working independently, but we saw that there was an opportunity for us to be able to collaborate and just create something more cohesive. So what we decided on doing was creating like a two part course where they started with a, a, a more self guided self paced um, course a, in Ecuador. But we did communicate like what you were mentioning about communicating courses like via social media. So we both shared our courses on on social media so that that could be something that it would bring in participants to the Ecuador course. So once participants were able to finish that course, that was independent, but moderated by a the trainers at a EIL. Um, and the idea is that this will serve as a database and as a pool of teachers that will then go on to our course that is a more, um, so it does have an online component, but a, where we are facilitating sessions and it will be more like a face-to-face -face kind of experience for, for participants. It, the idea is that we're going to try to um, invite teachers who are from Ecuador, from Guatemala, but also from Honduras, so that we are able to kind of uh, serve different regions uh, with a basic STEM uh, training uh, for teachers. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, <laughs> Adeline. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, there's something very slow about it's not showing me if I'm muted or not immediately. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, thank you, Marvella. I, I guess I would just add we we sort of we realized that both of our centers were a little torn between trying to reach a lot of people the way something more like a MOOC or um, a moderated but large uh, asynchronous course can or working more in depth with a smaller group of teachers in a synchronous way. Um, and so we're able to do both because we're collaborating. So 
we have in our in our course right now, we have over 400 people signed up and over 200 are actively participating right now. But then we're sending eight of those people um, from Ecuador uh, to, to work with EGA. And so there'll be a smaller group with eight people from each country. So we can kind of get the best of both world, worlds with both the, the reach and the more uh, in-depth contact with the participants. Thanks so much and for sharing. And, um, you know, it's really interesting. And, and uh, thanks for uh, being uh, accepting to be on the spotlight for a few few seconds there. Uh, if um, you know, I would encourage everyone if you're if you you know if you're curious about and more you want more details about this, feel free to reach out to to Adeline and, and Marbella to to find out more about the, their their collaboration, um, which is really exemplifies a lot of the things that we're we're talking about today. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, so thus far, we've talked about partnerships and programming and resources, and this is one of them. And if you want to find out a little more, uh, you can go to the website that I have uh, there on this slide, and uh, we'll share the, the PowerPoint with you. So um, feel free to go there uh, to the website in which uh, it's actually a, a this is a, a digital channel, a me is the digital media channel, which uh, provides different resources. And a lot of these ideas were also you, you can find there more details as to how to uh, carry out um, programming partnerships. Okay. Uh, so, moving forward, um, the, the other type of, um, you know, partnerships that, you know, I wanted to discuss are more along the lines of uh, potential funding partnerships. But before we go into that, I'd like to ask, uh, what are some aspects that you take into account with uh, when partnering based on funding? So, like, when you think about the, you know, the, the more traditional, the more sort of, uh, you know, typical type of partnering, which is the funding partnering, partnership, what are some aspects that you take into account as an organization? And in this case would be, let's say, if there's an organization that is interested in funding a program that you have or, or coming or coming on board and, and, you know, supporting a program, what are some aspects that you take into account? And again, feel free to type in the chat if you like. <clears throat> right. Let's see. Um, let me just see a, a quick, uh, uh, you know, like a quick survey. Like, well, how many of you would say that the, the vision is something that you take into account and feel free to raise your hand or the little icon if you can find it there um, to say you know one of the things that we take into account is the vision the, that you know this funding organization has okay um, how about the um, their their goal for long-term sustainability okay Good day. all right so those are some some Possible aspects to take into account. I wanted to share these, which I've, uh, you know, I've, you know, we've worked through and we've experienced working with different organizations. One of them is the fact that, you know, we need to look at, uh, you know, whether or not the visions are the organizational visions are aligned. And that's uh, the, the key aspect, right? We, we want to make sure that the two organizations are, uh, are have a common goal and have common core values. And this is why at the beginning I mentioned a lot of our common values, um, you know, our core values as an organization, which include uh, community, uh, you know, long-term sustainability, the role of uh, inclusion and, and justice as well in our programming, right? And, and so when partnering up with organizations, these are some key aspects that we look into. Um, we also want to, Think about uh, in the in terms of like best use of resources, and um, you know one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that the key question is how are these two organizations complementing each other, right? How do we complement each other as organizations? Um, 
you might have been in this situation where you were in conversations with an other or another organization and they did exactly the same thing that you do, right? And so the question is, how can these two very similar organizations work together? Is it possible or is it maybe not the best option, not the best way to for resources to to be to be used? And and in in, in those cases, it might be a matter of actually referring organizations to other that may be more complementary than our than ours are. Um, and so, for example, um, going back to my uh, my example here with the community center where I volunteer, um, a another another community center approached them uh, a couple of years ago to ask them if they could collaborate with their English language learning program, and they were offering exactly the same thing that was already pretty much set up at this organization where I volunteer, and their answer was. Well, you know, I think our program is set up, but we could refer you to another. There's another community center that is looking to start a program and they don't have a lot of resources to do it. So maybe they would be more interested. And so in that case, it's a matter of also analyzing how are we really making the best use of resources when partnering? Is this the best use or are we overlapping? And in that case, creating uh, a bit of an excess in the use of resources, or maybe not allocating them in the best way possible. Um, again, is the, another question is, is there a capacity building for both organizations? How, you know, what kind of capacity will this project build for us? And how can we contribute also for the funding organization as well? How are we contributing to their mission? And there's also the idea of two way communication and partnership. And this is something that's really important is to actually know what the funders history is in terms of implementing prior projects. Uh, is communication a key value, a core value in this organization? Because as I mentioned before, implementing is very messy. It can get completely messy at times. And so. We want to make sure that there is uh, this open communication as well. And those are some aspects that I just wanted to bring up. There are many others, and I would encourage you to think about some of those also as we move forward in future projects. Okay. Um, and finally, uh, I also wanted to mention in terms of the partnerships, I wanted, I wanted to mention some partnerships to connect students to STEM organizations. And this is the idea of building bridges between the classroom and learning in, uh, in, re in real life, connecting students to local communities and resources, potentials. There's a potential also for civic engagement and job prospects and reducing project costs and creating a name for the school or the center. And by, uh, STEM, by STEM organizations, what we mean is that if you have a STEM program, whether it's a school program or an extracurricular program, we encourage you to also find organizations locally or internationally that can that you can connect your students to and that they can actually access and have uh, access to more resources beyond the resources that you're offering at your center. So it's a matter of not only providing students with instruction in STEM, but also helping them build a network in uh, with build a network which will lead them into professional uh, and career um, more career oriented um, yeah, connections you know we're not instructing students or not we're not working with students just for the moment but also building workforce skills that will be useful to them in the long run we're also supporting students to develop their own professional networks and to learn what are some of the available resources and, and, and in the process also building their civic engagement as well. And so some of those examples of organizations that are STEM organizations that offer resources to students free of access are Code Nation, the Curiosity Machine, Girls Who Code, Iridescent, STEM 101, and Stoked. So some examples, and I actually included the website where you can find the links to these organizations and the resources they offer and the PowerPoint. Uh, and these are some options, you know, in which, you know, you can also connect students uh, to a wider world of, uh, um, of STEM, a wider universe of, of STEM beyond your program. Um, 
I I wanted to 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 stop there and ask, you know, what are some ways in which you're already connecting your students to other out to outside resources and organizations? Or what are some ways in which this could happen under the current Cisco project as well? Thinking, you know, we do have some uh, some resource partners as well. Okay. Right. Okay. Any any idea? So uh, I, I think maybe one that I can share is how um, you know we have the the we have a partnership with the Lab Exchange. That's also you know uh, a clear option. But also, I guess what I would also uh, promote is the idea of exploring some of these sites as well, um, which you know could be uh, some options to connect students to STEM organizations then. I think I have a comment here from Marbella. It uh, says that the the uh, Iga High School was able to partner with the STEM Center in Algeria, right? Uh, Marbella, would you like to briefly share about that? Um, according to what I I wasn't like completely involved because the mm -hmm. the Iga School, the high school, is a little bit separate to what I do specifically. But I do know that uh, there was some teacher development happening, but then also I think that there was an opportunity for students to mm -hmm. interact and to be able to do projects together uh, with students in Algeria. So I think that that was just a, a very um, like it was a very rich experience for both teachers and for students. Okay. Yeah. And uh, thanks, Marbella. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the the idea, right? How to how to connect students beyond uh, or outside of your program, uh, because a, a lot of the a, a lot of learning also you know takes place on in an autonomous manner, right? And and also more of the the the, the students' motivation to to find more information and to in a way to, as we would call it, to geek out, right? In, um, in, in the resources that are out there available, uh, which, you know, uh, it's a great way to serve students as well. Um, the other, um, the, the final thought that I wanted to share is uh, just think in terms of looking for partners, um, there's, you know, certain uh, areas that we suggest that are, you know, key areas for organizations to, to be able to develop and to have in order to uh, sustain and to look for partnerships. One of them is engaging in, um, sorry, it should be thought leadership and academic community. Okay, not guru, but thought. So, uh, sometimes it's a glitch of the brain, sorry about that. Uh, but, you know, engaging in, in thought leadership and in the academic community in, in STEM in this case, you know, who are the key players in your country? Who are your key players in your region? And engaging also in in presentations, forums, uh, sharing of material and ideas. Uh, there's also the you know a key point is to share your success stories. You know what are some of the things that you've done that could be highlights that will you know um, you can share with with other with other individuals who want to volunteer with families with funders. What are some things that you can share? Um, there's also you know, the, the need to develop some, what we would call capacity statements, which are, you know, like reader friendly summaries of what your organization does so that everyone uh, can read it, not necessarily in education. This has been a big challenge that I've experienced sometimes from coming in from a more technical side and meeting with potential funders. Uh, uh, the conversations from our side may be more technical and sometimes the funder is not necessarily an educator but an administrator in a ministry or, 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 you know, or, or, or an organization. And so we also uh, have seen the need to develop very reader friendly statements that can share about the different projects that we've developed. Um, also, um, you know, if this is something you want to do, like developing some costing models for your programs, meaning 
there are some funders who want to know what the, you know, what the cost will be for a particular program. It's always a good idea also to have that, um, that costing model already to say it will cost this much for these many students. And finally, building, um, building your programming from a top, a bottom to top approach, which means, um, one of the best ways to inform the programming that you build and that you can offer to funders or particular potential partners is uh, to bring up ideas that you've implemented or ideas that really reflect what students will be interested in. Um, sometimes we have great ideas, but they don't necessarily, they will not necessarily stick with the students, right? So it's, it's always good to hear what the students are interested in and what the context is requiring. Because that's going to be more responsive to in, in uh, you know, when you present it to, to a funder as well. Um, I want to uh, stop there and see if you have any questions. Uh, if not, you know, it's really been a, a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I, um, you know, I wish I had more time, but it's, it's very limited. And so do you have, if there are any questions, maybe I can take 1 or 2 questions. If not, uh, feel free to email me uh, whenever a question comes up. And like I said, it's been great. And thanks so much for, for your time this morning.